Welcome, John. Thank you so much for hanging out and, and being being patient with me. Hey, no problem at all, Mark. Um, it's our, as always, it's our pleasure to be involved with your role in communication and with activism and with communicating our words and messages out to the public. Yeah. Can you tip your screen so your head is higher in the, in the frame? Yeah, yeah, okay. like, like that. A little right. more. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Great. So we're getting a little bit of lag, but so you're talking to us today from nearby McPherson, correct? Right. Actually, I'm facing McPherson. We're just across K Street from McPherson. As you know, today is our, our one-year anniversary at this moment, literally one year ago, about 10 to 15 young folks unrolled their sleeping bags in the park and sat underneath the freedom tree and began discussing issues that were important to them. And so today, you guys, we watched a good bit of you. Or we were watching our friends Organizer X and Occupy I stream, and we saw a good bit of John Zangus on his bicycle running around and herding. So it looked like you had a pretty good day, but then the weather got wonky on you tonight, right? Yeah, the weather did what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to remind us that we are all subject to it whenever mother nature has, has something to say she reminds us that we're su her subjects exactly and uh, occasionally we we need that so were you pleased with the with the day how it turned out and how it opened up and evolved I, I, i've actually been pleased with the whole year um very little has disappointed me because even even the setbacks are part of the learning experience but as far as the day went, it was fantastic. We had Organizer X. We had Occupy. We had Occupy Carlisle. The live streamers were there. Tweeters were there. The press was there. Almost all the major networks were there. Um, they met and followed us right on Kennedy Street at Farragut Square at 7 a.m. this morning. And we began uh, marching and protesting down K Street into various businesses and energy companies and lobby firms all throughout the city. Good. So you made a good presence. And I was uh, following uh, Jenna Pope for a while, too, and saw her tweet that you guys successfully closed the intersection or two and kind of disrupted business as usual on K Street. We did. Now, it wasn't our objective to shut down businesses for the whole day, although the press seemed to make it seem like that's what we were going to do. Uh, that's not our objective. Our objective is not to stop commerce completely, not just to let them know that we're here. And it's been a year, and our objective was we met our objective just like OWS met their objective up in New York two weeks ago. Excellent, excellent. So all in all, you feel like it was, was a good day. Were spirits high and good vibes around everybody? People seem to be excited and energetic. There was a lot of energy, considering yeah, I, that it got warmer toward the middle of the day. There was a tremendous amount of energy, and it was also bittersweet. There were people that I hadn't seen since the early part of Occupy. People came from all over the country to be here. People came off from the West Coast. From A lot of people came from New York. Three busloads or three vanloads of people came from New York in solidarity with Occupy D.C., because just about everybody from Occupy DC went up to OWS for S17. Right, so it was right. really exciting to see all these people come here uh, to support us. And really, they're not supporting us, so to speak, as they are supporting the 99, the voices of the 99. Right. Um, do you feel like uh, since the one-year anniversaries are rolling around that there's a um, a larger sense of, of unity and that that has matured a little bit? And that's a good question because there have been one of the things that we've talked about is the burnout or the, the just the activism itself is there's no pay. Um, there's very little support. A lot of the folks are, are suffering personal hardships, but they're out here on the street doing some incredible things. They're educating themselves. They're getting the word out through outreach to the other communities. And it's very it's a very important aspect of activism when you're trying to build a movement is to outreach to others mm -hmm. and so when people came here it was 
it was really exciting seeing them. And the, the energy was phenomenal. I hadn't seen this type of energy in quite a long time. And um, so I want to make sure I have my facts right. And so you, you can correct wherever I misspeak. But my understanding is that Freedom Plaza is actually going to, is permitted and there is going to be an encampment by the vets or is that mistaken? Actually, that is actually correct. The The veterans still hold a permit there. Then they have been maintaining a tent there uh, since the springtime, I believe. They've been out there very loyally, staying in that park. I don't believe they're allowed to sleep there. I think sleeping is definitely out of the question, but they've maintained the POW camp. And you know that when you see the POW camp, who sits under that camp, who, who sits under that flag? But without a doubt, those are the veterans. Yeah. And um, so tell us about the scene at McPherson this evening. Is there a good many people there? Or is the weather kind of dampened people's spirits? And kind of what what's on on stack around there? McPherson was extremely exciting. As you know, we, we marched and we protested all the major lobby firms, energy companies, and businesses that we have been vociferously complaining and protesting over the last year. And we visited just about every one of those in a very long marathon protest today. We spent a few minutes in front of each place, like Monsanto and Cargill, Alec, Pepco, British Petroleum, J.P. Morgan, the banks, Chamber of Commerce, all these folks who are insidiously spoiling our economy. And then after we had mic checked all those folks, we went back to McPherson. And it was really cool because we set up our flag right there in the middle of the circle. We sat right there under the statue. We served each other beans and rice and sandwiches, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, the staple of the occupiers. <laughs> And we played Red Rover, we played games, and then the rain came and we got under a tarp. So people were under tarp start, staying dry. But most of us just enjoyed the rain because we haven't been there in a year. And the grass was lush and green. And <laughs> thank, thank you to the Park Service for letting the grass grow back. Because we knew it would. I mean, all the complaints over the last year about there being rats and, and the grass getting run down. I told them then that the grass wasn't the issue. The issue is the economy, social issues, the ecology. The grass is the least of our worries. And sure enough, there it is, green everywhere. There's not even a brown spot anywhere. Excellent. Well, it's a good good indicator that, you know, I always say water and gravity always wins and grass comes in a close third because it, it will grow if it is left alone to grow, right? <laughs> so there's a good object they, lesson there. And, and Mother Nature always has a lot to say, no matter who we think we are, how big and tall we think we are. She is the component, she is the physics, and she is the final decider in, in what goes on here. That's for sure. Well, um, I'm really grateful you could, could spend the evening with us. Again, I apologize for the delay, but um, it's good to have you here. Um, what, what do you guys have planned for in the near future? What's what's Occupy DC got? I know you guys are always organizing, always busy. You got something on, on stack for sure. Yeah, we, we have got quite a bit of action planned for the next week. I can't recite all the action items to you unless somebody grabs the, the plan for the week. Do you have the, maybe I have it in my back pocket. Um, but in any case, we have, in, actually I do have it in my back pocket because I, I knew I'd need it. Um, we have an action plan for every day this week from, from today, which was Monday, all the way to Friday. And it's a celebration of our birthday. I believe tomorrow we're going to the Veterans Administration because you know that, and we've said this before, that 25% of our folks out here in Occupy are veterans. A lot of them don't even talk about it. And I've personally spoken to some of the veterans, and they don't want to talk about it because they still have issues dealing with uh, the sacrifices they made. But so tomorrow we're going to be going to the VA. That's just one of the places we're going to. Um, so we've got quite quite a plan coming up for this week. Um, I think uh, we're going to do break the banks the day after tomorrow. That's the thing. 
And then on the next day, it's the election day. We're going to be talking about political parties and protesting. Excellent. On the, the earth, the ecological issues, the ecology, the sustainability. And it'll be a day of action going to various places for that. And then on the 6th, we're going to be celebrating the actual anniversary. As you know, there was McPherson and Freedom Plazas, okay? McPherson Square and Freedom Plaza. And the, the 6th of October is actually their birthday. Mm -hmm. But presently, we're considered one big family. Right, right. Excellent. You guys have a busy week. And do you what website can people look at in order to, to follow what's going on for the week? I'll, type, I'll type it in. Yeah, it should be OccupyDC.org. I believe it's OccupyDC.org. Uh, another really cool website to follow is CoolRevolution.net. The lady who will be speaking here in a moment uh, puts up uh, blogs and writes concise stories with excellent photography concerning the actions that go on with Occupy and has been doing so since almost nearly the very beginning. Right, and I want to recommend that you know I've been following her since we we met in uh, in uh, September seventeenth, and we spoke with her, and she has an excellent excellent site there, and is really working hard, and we're looking forward to having her on as a solo guest one night. So I'm excited that she's here with you tonight. But I highly recommend everybody. Um, she's a great a great media representation of the movement, not only in Occupy DC, but but all over, she is a, a good source of information. So, um, so who? So we we have a cool revolution there tonight. Who else did you bring along? Because you always bring along the most interesting and inspiring people. And I know you got a crew with you. Yeah, I've got I've got so many people lined up. I can't even fit them all in. Um, I have a gentleman here named Todd Todd Fine, uh, who is a Harvard graduate and very articulate and knowledgeable on the issues. Um, people come up to me and say, wow, who is this guy? Uh, he's so interesting to talk to. And he's like one of the best kept secrets of Occupy, but we really want uh, him to, to be on the show tonight and talk. And I'm really excited to, to have him speak with you and your, your listeners and your viewers. Um, and so I guess uh, do either of which would you? I'd like to maybe get Todd on right now. Okay, you're you're the MC. You you bring on the guests however you'd like to. I'll try to keep up. Um, just one thing before Todd starts that I wanna wanna say that um, Occupy DC. This is our anniversary. We we went to many sites and locations today. Of the city's behaviors of banks and lobby firms, and they've really woven a tight web around control and the systems. But what we proved today is that we're still here strong. There are still many people here advocating. The fact that we can pull people from all around the country and a lot of active people who are in just in this community can come down here. We shut down K Street. We didn't stop K Street altogether. That was not our intent. Mm -hmm. But we made our presence known. We we did have one small issue. A person got hurt on the leg, but that was treated by our medical staff, and she's going to be okay. And we're really looking forward to the next year. There are still a lot of challenges before us. There are, the issues are not going away, and we're not going away either. And we're here to stay. Our numbers go up and down, but the important thing is that folks take a rest when they need to. Uh, and, and the rest, the rest is necessary. You have to take care of yourself when you're back activism. And I've experienced that myself, getting burned out, not being able to wake up in the morning. So you really have to rest, feed yourself right, take care of yourself best you can. Right. And without any more delay, I want to let Todd speak to you. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, and you're not done for the evening. I'll get you back on, but we want to talk oh. to these other folks too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be here as long as you, you want to go on. Okay. Okay. Hi. All right. Hello, Mark. Hi. How are you, Todd? Thank you for joining us tonight, and I apologize for the delay. Usually, we're we're pretty much on time, but I was having all kinds of technical difficulties. Thanks for yeah, joining uh, us. 
that comes with the technology. It never works like it's supposed to. Uh, that's for sure. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your, yourself and your role in uh, Occupy DC and Occupy in general? Well, myself, uh, I, I publish actually Arab American literature. Uh, this early writer, Amin Rahani, who was a contemporary of Khalil Gibran, and I have a lot of overarching issues with the way things are going. I mean, John, John mentioned that I, w I was a Harvard graduate, so I saw a lot of the banking issues and the elite and things up close. And for me, I'm 31 years old, so for me, the um, they say that what, what, what happens when you're 20 years old kind of uh, determines you for the rest of your life, when you come of age. And for me, that was 9-11 and... You know, my adult life has been crisis after crisis, and things just getting worse and worse. And for me, Occupy is was is largely just a, an an awakening, a tantrum of of catharsis after a long period of people feeling like they they didn't have a voice, that they couldn't come together. And so I see Occupy as a you know it's a cliche, but as a conversation, mm -hmm. as uh, as a taking open space for people to just figure out where we're at and what what is where are we headed um and so you've been involved with the movement since the beginning and was it your first first entry into activism or had you done things prior to that i had done um activism actually on nuclear weapons uh, i was involved with the creation of this this organization called global zero which dealt with uh, reducing nuclear weapons, and so that that's a particular area of concern to me, just because of the the, the, the global situation. But I, I've also done um, been was very interested in the financial crisis and the details at first of the banking uh, stuff. One thing that Occupy has made me realize is that many of the problems that I thought were technical problems dealing with the banking system that perhaps could be resolved or reformed may not be that simple and being around Occupy, being around some of the problems in DC made me maybe be, become a little bit more radical even in my own politics. Mm -hmm. And are you local to DC? Yeah, yes, yes, okay. in Arlington. Um, and so if, if I get into things that you don't feel like responding to, it's fine for you to say I'd prefer not to respond to that. Um, I was wondering are you a full-time activist or do you have a day job and and live your life through activism, or how how do you integrate your activism into your have, your whole have, life? I have, I have streams of income. I I hate the terms work and job because it distances yourself from what you do on a, a daily basis. But I have uh, I'm involved with a school, and then I also earn income through uh, through this this publishing endeavor that I have. Okay, um, and I always like to. You know, bring that out because a lot of people, a lot of the viewers and the chatters that watch are always wondering how they can integrate activism into their daily lives because, you know, they have these these daily lives. And we've had some speak, people speaking to us recently about how it's important and necessary to do what you can where you are, you know, not to not to pick one path. So I love to hear everybody's backstory because we all find it really inspiring. Well, for me, the, the first principle is to, to never do anything that you, you feel morally uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. I think that that is an absolute, uh, if you want to be satisfied with your life, is to not do anything that you have any moral qualms about uh, and to be comfortable with it. Uh, so if that, sometimes that entails sacrificing certain opportunities that might come your way, but I think overall in your life, in your soul, you're more comfortable that way there are I mean I, I think that earning income uh, is is something that is that nobody feels comfortable with there's always there's always uh, you're, you're always making some kind of exchange and there's it's, it can be difficult but I, I think there are ways for instance I work you know I'm involved with I've been doing debate coaching debates mm -hmm. uh, working with young people that's sometimes a way where you can feel that you're you're contributing uh, I also so I'm um, involved, as I said, I publish books and involved with intellectual things. So. Right. 
Um, and while we're well, on that, yeah. that I, little... don't, I don't think it's easy, and I know a lot of people. I, I feel that a lot of people can occupy. Hold on, we've lost audio from you. No, I can I can hear you now. Okay, okay. I I think it's a Skype thing, so so maybe re if you could repeat that last little bit. Wow, they're way out of sync. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Now we're getting a better connection. Skype seems to be having a few issues tonight too, on top of everything else. All right, can you hear me now, Todd? Uh, yeah, it's a little slight, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you were finishing up that thought about um, earning income and how that affects activists. Excuse me. <laughs> you got a bus. I said you were you were finishing the thought about earning income and how that affects activism. Yeah, I was. I was saying that I think well, not for a lot of the young people in Occupy. Not only are they having trouble finding uh, well-paying jobs, but there's, there is a problem with a lot of the conditions of modern work mm -hmm. uh, in the service industry that I think a lot of people find intensely alienating, if that's their only option. And I, I can understand why some people make the choice to, to drop out. Right. Um, and because I, the work is very totalitarian. Right. I can understand that, too. We were in a discussion earlier today about working poor and how that's just a, a downward spiral and how difficult it is mentally and emotionally and physically. Um, how do you feel like we're doing on outreach as far as a movement and what could we do more and better? What Occupy can do? Yes, as far as outreach. Well, I, I am one of these strange people that doesn't, tries not to put the burden on Occupy. And this is a very important point because I, I feel that the crises that we have experienced, the, the wars, the banking crisis, these are things that I think are widely known and are self-evident. Mm -hmm. And Occupy is more of an emotional reaction among a certain class of people that have had enough. And I don't think the occupiers should have the burden of trying to plan how they can ma you know, manage a mass movement of millions of people to fight uh, in intractable structures. I see Occupy as more a spiritual effort, as a, an effort to build community, to just find ourselves in the wake of these catastrophes. And so, therefore, uh, I, I put I also put the burden on people who are not in Occupy, or or if they're not in Occupy, or not are disengaged and atomized from these problems. So, to the extent that Occupy should do better, what I do advocate is that we should do more in engaging with the history of social struggle that has worked. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, one thing we've done Occupy DC is we've done a weekly vigil at the Frederick Douglass House in Anacostia mm -hmm. because we made the argument that, that uh, Frederick Douglass in D.C. is an important symbol that we can learn from him and, can, and his symbol can bring other people into the movement. So I think generally reaching out to people through symbols is effective but not in terms of a master plan for some program that may or not may not come may, or some hierarchical organization. Right. That was that was well well put and a good observation too because you know we we talk about these movements in total um, and we don't want Occupy necessarily to have to lead everybody else. We would love to see everybody rise up of their own accord, and that we can all be catalysts and in inspiring and encouraging to others. So um, I I really like that and I'm glad you mentioned Frederick Douglass again. Um, have you lost sound from us? I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so why don't we, we're having a lot of lag here. 
So I'm going to hang up and call you right back, okay? And we'll see if a new connection makes it better, okay? I'm going to call you right back. All right, we'll we'll see if that makes the connection a little better. Are you able to um, Are you able to hear us a little better? Yeah, we can hear you better. It was it was really laggy. Um, your camera is yeah. off right now. Okay, our camera's off. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you are able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. And uh, to get your camera on, you just go down where the little menu bar will pop up, and you'll see yeah. a camera icon. And, and start video. There you yeah. go. Hey. Excellent. Cool. Sorry about that. It was, it was so laggy. It's a yeah, Skype yeah. thing. I think it's the weather, too, you know. Yeah. yeah, the weather is a little bit weird, and we were... Temporarily interrupted by a truck that pulled up to with a refrigeration unit. So, <laughs> let us know we can okay, no, we're we're good. We're on, so we can keep rolling. Okay, Todd was talking. Come on back, Todd. Please. Yeah. Get the, the back <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Sorry, it's it's this is live stream. How it oh, goes, okay. buddy. Um, I was trying to remember what our our last thought was. We were kind of rounding up the idea of how it's everybody's responsibility to rise up and speak out, I think, is where you were headed with that. Right. I was, I was saying that I'm opposed to treating Occupy like a mass movement that needs to be organized. I think that the problems that we're facing at this point are so sophisticated and so entrenched that we can't even off, we can't even offer a solution. You know, we can't even say this is our program because the problems are so deep. All we can really do is create a space for discussion. I, I think that's about all we're ready for right now. Sadly. Um, well, I agree, and I actually became more aware through working with the people in Charlotte and some other projects about the importance of the space, which is which is what you just mentioned. And when we interviewed Lauren uh, DeJoya, she was making that point that we, we can have these conversations, but we need these places and spaces in order to do that person to person. And that that was one of the great values of, of Occupy. Right. And that's, I think that's, that's why I think that it's very hard to criticize Occupy because Occupy achieved that goal very well. Um, and I really appreciate um, your efforts and all the all the work you've done. Um, and I'm grateful that you're here tonight. Are there any closing thoughts you'd like to give before we get the next person on? And do you have a website that you would want us to reference for your particular work or anything? Uh, related to Occupy, I know. I, I, I sometimes post on the D.C. mic check uh, newspaper. So I'll plug that. That's okay. a, a newspaper that came out of the Occupy DC movement. Okay. Great. We'll put and that up. I, I think uh, DC, DC Mike Check dot org. That's D C M I C Check dot org. Okay. Great. We got it in if we put this kind of stuff in the chat stream, so and um, thank you so much for being patient and, and speaking with us. It was wonderful to meet you and thank you for being out there. And listen to John. He's a smart man. Get your rest. Feed yourself. You know, be in here for the long haul. We're all in it together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're the one. Hey, how are you, Anna? It's good to see you. Now, 
Let's tip the screen up so your head's up in the top third. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah, why don't you introduce yourself? And I know who you are, but let's tell people who you are and what you do. Um, my name's Ann Metter. Um, I'm live in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, man. Skype's killing us tonight. Giving us more than absolutely giving us more than I've lost video of you. Are you there? Yeah, I just came back on, so Skype is killing us tonight. <laughs> it's a challenge. Um, so, like I said, I, I write for DC Mic Check too, like Todd does. Um, no, you need to um, put your camera on. So, you just go down to the menu bar and click on video. There you go. Alright. So, we'll struggle through. Just just keep on. This is it. <laughs> you do still photography, right? So, you don't have all this, all this kind of problem all the time. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay, so I'll introduce you a little bit. This is Cool Revolution. I'll leave that to the live stream. Yep, so um, which is the blog we referenced a while ago, coolrevolution.net, uh, and Meter. And uh, we're lucky to have her here tonight. She is um, a longtime activist in the D.C. area. So tell us a little bit about what you do and how you're involved with D.C. Um, my... I've been an activist for a really long time, um, a lot in human rights, a lot in civil rights. Um, I took on a different role with Occupy DC. I sort of became an observer, and I started writing, and I started blogging, and I started taking pictures. So this was um, different for me. Um, you know, I took up the citizen journalism role. Mm -hmm. And um, have you learned a lot by working as a citizen journalist around the Occupy movement? Because you have a frame of reference from your previous activism, but how does it, how does it compare? Um, it, you know, it's a very different role to be a little bit more of an observer than an organizer, but I mean, it's really turned me on to, um, you know, John was new, um, you know, that you were just talking to. He was new to activism altogether, and he's also taken up this journalism role as well. Um, you know, tweeting, taking pictures, and so forth. Um, it's, but it's really turned us on um, that the fact that we can observe and have our own perspective and put it out there, have a point of view, and. Um, we both feel that this is, is really important for everyone uh, to consider doing. Uh, just putting out your own point of view um, of what you observe and what you see. And it's a very good counter to all the filters that we get through mainstream media outlets. And as a, as a journalist slash media person, I, I have a question. My recent drum I've been banging that's near and dear to my heart was um, you you probably use digital delivery for a pretty pretty big part of your work as I do okay. and one of the conversations I've been having is how can we get beyond that because of accessibility to a wider range of people um, like I have to imagine a lot of the people in Anacostia may not have internet service or they don't have appliances. So how do we reach them effectively? What are your ideas on that? Um, I wish I had good ideas. Um, for example, our newspaper, DC Mic Check, was in print um, for the first several months of Occupy. I believe we printed six issues. And um, I think we had a union helping us uh, fund that. Uh, and then, you know, that just dried up, right. and uh, we don't have any more money to print. We've been trying to fundraise, and, uh, you know, print is expensive. Um, the old is, is expensive. Um, digital is easier, and it's less expensive 
often. Right. So, um, you know, those kind of solutions are hard. And um, do you, is Occupy DC working on any of those sorts of solutions or is that discussion being had? Because I think conveying the information to people is, is critical, you know, through every possible platform. Well, you know, it's always an issue because there are a lot of people involved in Occupy who don't have computers at all. So um, there's always a little bit of a war going on between those who are very much on online and on social media all the time and those who can't access it um, who are saying we're not part of the conversation we may not be informed of what's happening um, because essentially maybe they're, they're either partially living on the streets don't have computers don't have cell phones um, there are a lot of occupy activists in this situation and um, so that's a real dichotomy in Occupy that we have to deal with constantly is highly digitized, highly online, and then people that, you know, aren't, don't have much access to it at all. Right. Um, it's a challenge that we have, and I don't know what the right way to overcome it is, but we need to be, be talking about it. So how did you feel about today? Did it, did it unfold? Um, in a manner that you felt was positive and productive? Yeah, I thought so. Um, lots of good energy. I mean, so many people, um, you know, turned out or came back to town. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, visitors to D.C. came. Um, lots of good energy. Um, I, I really believe in changing hearts and minds, um, public airing of grievances. Um, you know, you get a lot of stares, um, you know, they're at it again, those Occupy people out on the street. But uh, it's something we have to do. Um, you know, what is the difference between us and Spain? Um, are our problems any less than Spain? I, I don't think so. Um, they're out on the streets in massive numbers because of austerity measures. And we've got significant problems here, and people are very reluctant to go out on the streets, or they think that it's strange. Um, I interviewed some people watching our march today who are from Brazil, and they said, there are too few of you. Uh, where is everybody? There yeah. should be hundreds and thousands of you out here to deal with the kind of things that you are up against, the kind of corporate money and corporate corruption that you have in the United States, um, the political entrenchment. So um, you know, you know, it's different in other countries, and, and why is that? I think it's, it's our mentality, it's our, um, it's our consciousness that, that needs to wake up. Yep. I, I agree. And actually, I had somebody from Peru said the same thing to me today. And I have hesitated to ask the question because it's not fair to draw comparisons. But I said the same thing. Why are there 70,000 people in Spain surrounding their Congress building and we can't get 7,000? You know, what's the holdup? And when we were at DNC and I was interviewing people on the street, it, it seemed like there was a lot of apathy. Uh, when I think of you know, this recent Romney kerfuffle with the, with the video um, and the 47% supposedly who don't pay federal income tax, um, Republicans have over the years wanted to cut taxes and cut taxes and cut taxes. And now they want to make people feel guilty for not paying taxes. And I think there is a certain segment of the population that buys into that. Um, what's the explanation? I think it's a fall of consciousness. Um, it, it, and it pervades our society um, somehow that we don't stand up for uh, our grievances. Right. Um, and, and we're not even aware of them. Right. And so where do you 
that's a good way of framing it, a false consciousness. Where do you think that comes from, and what do we do about it? Um, you know, I, I was reflecting on that today because uh, culturally, I don't know where it comes from in our history, why it would be different in South America, why it would be different in Europe, why they like to get out on the streets, and we don't. Um, but what I like to um, write about on my blog or, or whenever I can is um, it really does start with the individual and changing our own consciousness and um, that does manifest outwardly and, it, and then we coalesce together as a group into social movements. Um, that's how really how things change from the inside out. Yep. And um, when we have you on for your solo interview, I want to explore this particular topic in depth because it's okay. it's one that means means a lot to me. So, uh, what's on tap for you the rest of the week? Are you going to be out covering the events and activities? Yeah, um, the veterans are going to be out there at the Veterans and Administration tomorrow, and um, I'll definitely be out there with them, supporting them. They're going to be occupying for uh, 48 hours. Um, you know, at least one vet has committed uh, to probably getting arrested. Um, there's also going to be, uh, as John said, several more themed days for Occupy DC. Occupy Baltimore is having their birthday on October 4th. Um, Freedom Plaza began on October 6th. That's also part of Occupy DC, so there'll be another birthday celebration there too. Saturday. Outstanding. Well, you got a long week in front of you, and thanks for being up at the end of a long day to talk to us. We really appreciate it. It's lovely to meet you in person. Uh, yeah, it's really nice to talk to you, Mark. Okay. Um, so, does John have another person lined up to speak, or is what's the story? Um, we don't have anyone else um, to talk. Do yeah, you want I, to talk some more? I can talk some more. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Have Mark. a good evening. Uh, yeah, hey, Mark, I'm back, and uh, our other guest had to leave. Um, she was a scientist who was with, uh, pretty much with Occupy Baltimore. And right. She came down to celebrate with us, but she had to catch the train back to Baltimore, which was leaving literally 15 minutes ago. So right. She had to leave. Well, My regrets. If, no, if somebody had been on time, it wouldn't have been an issue, But so it's my no. bad, my loss. <laughs> I didn't mean to infer that, but it's it's cool. Uh, it, things happen. Yeah, it's yeah. It's cool. We, we one thing we've learned is to always be flexible. You have a plan A, and you know that plan A is most likely not going to work. You have a plan B, and then for real assurance, you have a plan C. That, and usually end up with plan D in the middle of the fix. Yeah, so. that's why I'm sitting in a dark room. This was this was plan C, so you know. But it worked. So um, I want I would love if you feel comfortable doing it to give our our people some some background on you because I I know a little bit about your story, but um, you're 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 an organizer. We see you in New York. We're doing this, but I I know there's a whole lot to to John's Angus. So why don't you just give us an an overview. Uh, however much you would care to about your your life and your activism because you know you're you're an inspiring figure to some of us that are, are trying to do some good so it's nice to know what backstories are and where people come from well definitely I, I could do that um, I can tell a little bit about uh, me although I, I really feel this is about uh, so many other people who have been the wind beneath my wings. Uh, I apologize for the cliche, but uh, I I came new to the scene on activism. I watched my mother, um, when she was still alive, I watched her fight a developer in our neighborhood who tried to build condominiums when I was younger in, in a place which had been earmarked for homes. Um, and she fought the the city and the developer, and they fought they, a group of women uh, who at that time were generally homemakers, 
because they many of them weren't working. They just decided to take on this developer. And I watched her succeed in court against this person. So I guess the blood and the seed of activism may have been planted in me. I didn't even know it. But absolutely, a year ago, uh, when I look out here at the park, which is right in front of me, I didn't know anything about what activism was, never really had too much interest in it. But then when I walked by this park and I saw uh, a group of maybe 10 or 15 people out there, who considered themselves activists, or maybe some of them didn't even know what it was, and started speaking to them, all the interests they had seemed to parallel the interests I had. We had different ideas about how to solve them, but we definitely knew we had an intrinsic idea of the common goals we set forth to, to, to work towards. And so this last year, I, I, told other people this, it's been extremely educational, I, I just can't say enough how much you can learn by being with other people who you may not even have a, a common background with, but if you're working together and you have different ideas, those ideas that disagree with you cause you to think out of your box. If you're in a general assembly and you think you have an idea that's just great, and then you go around and, and 20 other people put their ideas you're like, wow, I didn't think of that. And it's an education. And not only that, but when you hear an idea, you should never believe it. You should research it for yourself. I've always been taught that. Always question, find out for yourself. Hear what the other person has to say. So I've done that. Over the past year, I've completely changed. The purpose of my life has changed. Todd mentioned that we concentrate on jobs and occupations from the standpoint of making money too much. I think Europeans have it right. I think that they don't make jobs and their workplace as important as Americans do. Maybe they have less issues with stress. Maybe that's why their economies are seemingly suffering more than ours are. But here, here to tell you, $15 trillion in debt, no, going on $16 trillion in debt, those are real numbers. Those numbers didn't just get created overnight. America has been on a free ride to the tune of $16 trillion. And that's just another issue. But off the point, the point is, is that my experience every day, every time I did something, I was learning something new, teaching myself. And in a year, I've learned more than I have with two college degrees in engineering, and in computers. And I would easily be able to trade two more years of activism in this park for both of those degrees and learn much more. The last year working with Occupy has taught me more than I've learned in 20 years of being in the workforce and two, two college degrees. Yet the college education that I put myself through school for and paid for, yes, those taught me how to think for myself. That's the benefit those gave me. So the best advice I could lend to other people maybe interested in going through this is understand that there are going to be a lot of challenges. Learn by teaching yourself and listening to other people who have different ideas and accepting that it's not the idea that's the issue, it's the goals and the visions that you're working towards. That was an outstanding summary to that, that bit, John. Thank you thank you for that it's divisions into goals divisions into goals and we need to keep our eyes on them um what else would you like to add this evening i i know you've had a long day and you'll be up and running again tomorrow so uh I, i'm very conscious of your time and energy <laughs> i appreciate that mark and one other thing that i've really learned is is the importance of communication communication will make and break you one of the things that I've learned recently is how important having a message is and articulating that message it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, we've, we've heard from several very, very well communicators and established people in our community, both Todd and Ann are very knowledgeable and well educated. They have their message, you know, Ann has her blog. I hope that some of the viewers get a chance to go to coolrevolution.net and go to dcmicecheck.org and read some of what Todd has written. 
Yes. But what I've learned, um, taking on myself, is to get involved in journalism with the DC Mic Check. And I'll be starting my own communications blog as well. Um, what I've learned through journalism is that there are so many elements that have to come together. And with the DC Mic Check, we have taken people with interest in volunteering in their community, editors, writers, reporters, uh, interviewers, photographers, and none of us, like Ann said before, she had no experience in photography, but she just spoke to other people who had that. And that's one of the beauties that Occupy has done. It's free information. We actually had a university, uh, Occupy University set up. We had teachings in one of the tents out there for a while. They are continuing with the concept of Occupy University at East House right up the street here. Information and communication are very important. But on the other hand, you don't want to use social media solely to do that. And it's a mistake for colleges and universities to use social media as a means to give classes because you really do need that, in, that human connection between people when you communicate. You communicate so much more in the message when there are people in rooms together or people outdoors together doing things that and experiencing life. I had were classes that I had outdoors with the professor and the students in small groups who we were out doing things. You can't get that on social media, whether you're doing online courses or tests or whatnot. That's just a little critique on that. Well, I think that's um, really so generally, valuable, yeah. It is, it is. You really, the, the human species has evolved through communication. And I don't mean to compare us to dogs, but dogs have a hierarchy. And they do that through lots of nonverbal cues. And human beings actually do that too. Mm -hmm. Now, Tom spoke earlier about the radical how he had become more radical, uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but in, in essence he was saying that he was looking at things a little bit more radically. I don't think the word radical is itself should ever be a stumbling block. Radical could also mean revolutionary or different. It could mean something that is not accepted as the norm. And I think what Occupy has achieved is it has provided a platform for people who are really suffering and really want to come forth and and tell their story and it's very compelling when you're sitting in a general assembly and you have people over here in this part of the park who are having this problem and over here another problem and they're all coalescing and they're discussing these issues and they're coming to a new synthesis of ideas and it's a, it's a beautiful thing to watch a young person come up with an idea and then have people discuss that idea and come to its fruition. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I, I love that the way you framed it is by, by telling and sharing the stories, you know, because I think that is the single most critical element we have, you know, for you to, for all of us to tell each other our stories because within that we find our commonalities. And from there we can band together to accomplish great things. And um, for those of you who are, are listening and don't know, uh, John is a very good writer, and you can see some of his stuff on CoolRevolution.net and DCMikeCheck.org. Um, he writes quite eloquently and has great visual imagery there. Um, and it is all a learning. It's an information exchange, education, and co-directional learning experience. And the more we can learn from each other and the more we can teach each other and share information the greater our strength is against these these just these entities that are just have us under assault 24 7. and you know the one of the important points that also needs to be made about the, the voices of the 99 and the 99 percent 99 is a pretty big number compared to 100. Um, uh, out of a correction is a big number out of a hundred that leaves one one percentage yeah, left yeah. that means that the 99 percent really already have the resources they already really have the power within themselves and the knowledge because they are uh, the large they're, they're large they're the large majority so all the 99 percent really has to do is just assume the power that they already have in their their souls and in their minds and in their thinking. They don't have to fight the 1% for anything. Uh, there's a lot of power in the, the concept of the boycott. The Einstein Institute 
has 198 concepts of nonviolent direct action. Anyone who wants to go to the Albert Einstein Institute.org and look that up, the 198 uh, methods of nonviolent protest, you'd be surprised how many of those Occupy has used to get its message out there. Occupy has been an example that other folks can follow. You don't have to be in a park and you don't have to be on the street protesting. You can occupy in your workspace by speaking out about things that you think are wrong. I hold a job in the evening. I won't mention the company that is on the air, but so as not to you know, embarrass anybody. But that what Occupy has caused me to do is take issues that I see that are wrong in my workplace and bring them up to management on a regular basis. We don't have a union, so therefore I have to be that voice of people who are being wrong. I see things happening in my workplace by this corporation that are so wrong, but I have to work within the framework of that organization to do things by right for everybody. I can't make a stumbling block to stop the business. I'm in that business, so I have to do what's right and speak out when things are wrong, but do it in an effective way. And you have to be careful how you do things. A, a person can have a, a huge influence on others, but it really needs to be framed positively, and it has to be shown how it benefits everybody, not just yourself. One of the things that really drives me crazy right now in our, in our society is this rise of selfish and selfishness and arrogance. And it's... It's insidious. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't see this much. Of it. Maybe I was naive and not educated, but I just see corporations just behaving in communities like they're owed something. Well, no, they're not. Corporations are merely organizations and tools to, for the betterment of society. It's not all about the Wall Street stock values and figuring out how you can get more money out of somebody by selling these CDOs and these certificates of debt and transferring them through the market so that everybody loses when the market goes down. That's a terrible thing to allow happen. I know I'm getting on a political issue here, but the Security Exchange Commission has given Wells Fargo and Bank of America and many others, Lehman Brothers, too many breaks. They've just allowed, I believe it was Wells Fargo the other day, or Bank of America, I can't remember which, to settle out of court for a huge fine, a couple of billion dollars, for a huge fraud. This positively cannot be allowed to continue. This type of behavior in the marketplace is detrimental to so many people in so many ways. If it was people Bank of America and it was $2.1 billion out of court settlement for fraud, which which you know means they still made a whole lot more money that they, they could afford to pay the fine. That's wrong and it's evil. <laughs> Right. Thanks for quoting me, uh, quoting that correctly. I knew that. It's just been a long week, and I've got the stats on it. But the point is this. At the same time, uh, a rather disorganized group of occupiers who have been out in the streets trying to get their voices heard, there have been over 7,000 arrests and incarcerations. I'm talking about people who have been arrested and incarcerated uh, until their courts or until their fines were paid or released. 7,000 for, and I'm not trying to say the law is not right here. I'm saying civil disobedience has its role in society. I believe as Thomas Jefferson said that the tree of liberty needs to uh, periodically be fed or watered by the blood of tyrants and patriots. What does that mean? It means that when there's something wrong in your community or in your society, that you're obligated as a citizen of it to correct that wrong and to write, write it for everybody. That's what that statement means. So that when an organization like Bank of America gets away with a mere $2.9 billion payment out of trillions of dollars of fraud, there's a big problem with that. The minute, the minute the Security Exchange Commission calls them to the carpet, calls them to the courtroom and puts some bankers on trial, and I know it's going to take a while to do it, but as soon as you have a couple of those managers called into court and they're not allowed to hide behind spreadsheet, spreadsheet lawyers, the minute they have sentences ruled on them, I guarantee you Wall Street will get its act together.
Right. Um, so can uh, and I appreciate all that and I'm just I hope I, you were we were on global revolution for a while so I hope they were covering that because that was such a, a great exposition there um, I, I just wanted to get your personal opinion on something because um, we have this conversation a lot you made the um, observation that in in your workplace for example you work within the framework that you have within that place by agreeing to work there to help resolve problems and make things better for all involved. To me, that seems like you are um, like a builder. You're not, you're just not out to tear down systems or tear down banks or tear down industries. You're willing to work to make them better. Is that an accurate assumption? And I guess what I'm asking is, do you feel there's value in um, working within our structures in a parallel way to make them better? Uh, I absolutely believe that if, and I know this is an idea, and I know this is kind of sort of a utopian aspect or a vision, but I absolutely believe if people play by the rules that are set forth by governments and by organizations that they agree to follow, that, that you won't have the problems that are building now. But there's also not just the letter of the law, but there's moral behavior and ethical behaviors that need to be somehow wound into the law. I don't know if that's possible. Maybe it's unrealistic. But if we continue the way we go, we are going with these large machines that are hard to pull in back in. They're off the rails, there's no doubt. These machines, are, these institutions are totally off the rails. If we continue to go the way they are, then we're not going to be able to do it through the law. Societies that have collapsed in the past have done so because of economic issues as well as agri agricultural issues. And those agricultural issues, the Mayans, I'm talking about the Romans, they, they didn't lose because of wars. They, they lost because they lost their way internally. Their government started to lose control of their economic systems, their social values. They just became decadent and their mor the morals and their ethics eroded. That's what we see happening in this country today. It's not an accident that the United States is starting to lag most Western countries in education. I believe we're 58. Um, we're, we're falling behind in many areas and it's not by an accident. It's because we're losing our way. Now we can either let these uh, problems be solved or worked on by activists like Act, like Occupy or other people who are interested in their communities, or we can ignore these, these voices of dissent, these voices of longing for being heard, for change. Keep ignoring those voices, and we don't know where these, these huge institutions are going to end up, but they're not going to end up going on like this forever. Um, I agree 100%, and I love, love that you bring up the voices of dissent. Amy Goodman said recently when I saw her speak that, dissent is what keeps us free um, so I think that's a valuable point um, so I have a question here and I asked the same question to Ann uh, but this is from Occupy DC Rob and and this is a question I like to ask too many of the Occupy cities believe that outreach is vital to the survival of the movement where would you like to see Occupy reach out nationally and locally and to whom I think that we need to start in Ward 9. Um, ward 9 is the Anacostia area of Washington, D.C. That ward, that particular ward, we're all really, it's over the river, over the Anacostia. That ward will tell us the most we need to know about Washington, D.C. K Street is flush with influence, cash, and power and control. Yet, right across the river, we have... 25% unemployment. And if you remember, during the Great Depression, a, de a, a depression was defined by the fact that the United States had 25% unemployment. Yeah, that's right. that's One in two folks in Anacostia are on some type of assisted living. Many men from that part of the, from the ward, from, from Ward 9, are incarcerated or have been incarcerated. And we really need to ask them what we need to do for them. I know a lot of organizations have gone into that word in the past. Um, and it's a struggle 
to try to bring it up. But they're more concerned about developing east of the river. And that's giving more money and more power to people who don't need it. I, I would really like to see us reach out. You know, outreach is very important for any organization like or loose organization like Occupy. Outreach is limited by your imagination. I was speaking to one occupier earlier, last, uh, late last night. We had set up 110 in the park, and this, this young lady who has actually been to Europe, her name is Ducky, she told me a story about what they did at Union Park in New York. They had two, two different groups that were constantly warring against each other from both sides of the park. They'd come and they'd fight. Well, one day, they decided, they were, I think they were called the Light Brigade or the Bridge Brigades. They're the folks that have put lights up on the bridges and messages. Well, it's, as, it's called asymmetrical, well, I've turned the, it's, it's called asymmetrical protest or asymmetrical uh, movement. What you do is you think of something completely radical, something completely different. Instead of going out and making noise and protesting, you come up with an idea that makes people come to you. What they did was they set up in the middle of this park, they just brought a bunch of furniture and they set up what was called an urban living room experience. They were a bunch of actors and they sat in the middle of this park and behaved as if they were in an urban, inside a city house, inside their living room. And they set up a TV, a couch, a carpet, table and chairs, and they had people playing games, watching TV. A guy rolled up in a carpet and they set it on the side. He leaned up against the wall. And people just walked around looking at him like, what the heck is this? And they started coming. And the next thing you know, people were like getting involved and asking questions and having discussions. And two equal and opposite sides who had been warring against each other were suddenly talking. And then it went on. They kept doing this. And the next thing you know, a few months later, they had a huge gathering of people who came there. I think it was happening on Sunday night. And I might get the details a little wrong, but one night, 600 people showed up for this event. And the, went to 3 o'clock in the morning, and the police came by and said, are you protesting? What are you doing? And they said, well, we're kind of protesting. And he said, well, it doesn't look like a protest. They said, so he said, okay, well, just keep going. Don't do anything wrong, okay? And they, <laughs> so they, they took a situation that was bad. They figured out a way that the people would talk to each other and to communicate and turned a bad situation. And now... This park has turned into a place where people can get together and there's not fighting anymore. That's a fabulous story, and it, it's a great example of what could be done. We just need to think broader. And also you're touching on arts and activism working together, which is something that's near and dear to me because that was the, that was the catalyst for that. You know, you gave something people different, something interesting, they found a common issue that they could get around and who could fight about that, and then they, they work out their differences or they realize they don't really have differences, so it's extremely valuable. These are yeah, the stories we need to spread far and wide. <laughs> right, I'm, and again, my facts and circumstances that I'm relaying at Peter told Paul, 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 told, uh, Paul told John, you know, I'm getting, I'm saying this second hand, but my point is, is that they came up with an innovative way to get people to communicate, talk, and, and understand each other through art, through right. acting, through props. And some of the most successful things we did out in Occupy involved art, visual and performing arts. We had bands, we had people with drums, we had um, displays, we had set up a fence with statistics on it, and just set it up right in the middle of, of Duck Lawn, and people were walking around press came and looked at it and we had huge um, 12 by 12 sheets of beautiful painted art that was just sitting out in front of right over there at the corner on McPherson and sat out there and it became, almost became an institution by itself. Artists should never be underestimated as a way to communicate. We've had this rise of something called Chalkupy and if you go back onto my Twitter feed and look at some of my, my photographs were to highlight what arts were being used. There were the, the theater groups, there was Chalkupy, there was the signs, there was a gentleman who, and this is an OWS, a gentleman who took photographs of people who made signs that said, what is my hope for the world? And he would take a picture of them and he would develop the picture right there on the spot and put it up on his tree of hope. 
and he built a tree of photographs of people with their hope. And, and people were crowding around the street to look at what other people were saying about what their hope was. I think it's posted online. If you Google Tree of Hope, OWS, S17, those general words, you might be able to find that. Um, there was also, I'll mention one other, it's also called um, Occupy Stories, Fleurs. I believe I'm pronouncing it's a French word for, for typists. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they set out seven or eight typewriters from the 1920s. So you're used to texting on your, your smartphone. Well, they had typewriters. So you really had to meticulously push, manually push the keys to type your story. And you were using carbon paper. Now, when was the last time anybody signed in carbon paper? That's right. Probably 20 years ago. Most people, most 20 somethings have no idea what carbon paper are. Probably, uh, I don't want to insult anybody, but carbon paper is just not used and hasn't been used since the 70s. Yeah, I don't even know where you'd get it, right? I mean, where, where would you find it? <laughs> paper occupies stories, and this guy pulled this out, and people were waiting in line to type up their stories with typewriters. And it was beautiful. It was like art at its finest, getting people to communicate and talk and tell and tell about themselves. And that's what the whole purpose of that was. Again... Occupy is not going to be able to solve the problems, but what it can do and what it has done very successfully and why we're still celebrating our birthdays is because we have provided a platform for people to come speak and tell their stories and come up with ideas and solutions that will fix some of the problems. And some of the ideas that are coming out of Occupy are really cool ideas. Um, when the liberal media and the conservative media criticize Occupy, we just laugh because it just makes no sense to put the onus of these problems on us just because we volunteered and come forth with no pay or little support from anybody to try to come up with solutions to solve them. Again, Tree of Liberty here, um, we're trying to do something that our, one of our forefathers called forth for us to do. We're not trying to make problems, we're trying to find solutions. Um, I, and that's the, the whole purpose of you know, the existence of OPN is we want to hear solutions. We want to see solutions. I'm asking somebody to find that Tree of Hope link <laughs> right now because I think that's a fabulous action. Hey, he Actually, I spoke to him. Actually, I did a sign myself. I, I was just, every time I saw a piece of art at work, and I didn't even mention half of them, um, I, I could spend an hour talking about how art has affected me and how I've seen all the wonderful ideas from art that have propagated through the movement and have made it a very colorful place to be. Um, there are so many fine artists, both performing and visual artists, and I'm sure there are other types of artists. People have written poetry. Actually, I've written a few poems myself because I've been inspired by some of the short Twitter poems I've seen. Um, but there's just about every type of form of art can be used to, to, to propagate or to communicate a message. One of our best performing artists, in my opinion, is a young lady by the name of Hopper. She wasn't here for the anniversary, but I miss her dearly. She has this, this almost this haunting voice of, of, of sound. She's actually done a, re a recording, but she was under the tent of dreams playing her, her guitar and singing with her voice and people the entire camp, when she was singing, the entire camp could feel her energy and got quiet during that time. So art can really be very powerful and can be a very good means to communicate. Um, and I believe that, you know, firmly. Um, somebody asked if there was an evening march and how it went. Uh, I believe there was an evening march which left at 7.30 from Freedom. I don't know what the outcome of that was because we we're getting ready here. I probably can find out. There are some live stream feeds there if you're on Twitter. There are, if you go, actually, if you go to my Twitter feed, you can find some of the, from earlier in the day, you can find some of those live stream feeds. There's Organizer X, there's Occupy Carlisle, Occupy underscore Air. Occupy I. All of these live streamers are potential folks that have probably followed and live streamed those recordings. And uh, another thing about live streaming, um, live streaming is folks who have decided to take on themselves to cover something that the established media doesn't do. 
Uh, it's not glorious work, but they cover minute by minute what happens on these marches and these protests. The, a lot of these guys and, and these men and women are doing this volunteer with their own pockets. Some of them are actually homeless. They don't have, you know, they're doing this with their own equipment. They're doing it on, they're doing it based on donations. So when you're watching a live stream, remember, if you have a couple extra dollars to throw into their, their donation, consider doing that. Thank you.